Church family, all doing okay this morning? Good? Everybody glad to be here in Jesus' name, amen? Give him praise, church, give him praise. Hallelujah! Want the rest of y'all come in, let's get ready for worship. Those of y'all with us, let's stand. We're going to be loud, we're going to have fun, and we're going to make the devil mad, amen? All right, here we go. Every praise is to our God. 
appropriate song to sing before you take communion where he says do this often in remembrance of me giving him thanks and praise for all that he's done for us why don't you be seated 
and uh, take the elements out that you were given as you walked in. Prepare to take communion together. You know, I'm going to say this. Uh, we were usually after events, you know, we'll have a staff meeting and talk about what went well, what didn't go well, what we should do next year. And uh, one of the things I said off of our family day, which was awesome, probably one of the best attended that we've had, um, that in the future when we do family day, I want it to center around communion that we take communion together before we go and we break bread out there together. We'll break bread in here together. Um, because family day is not a blow-off day. Family day is a very spiritual thing. The New Testament church spent time together. They did agape feast together. They fellowshiped together. They ate at the table together. And they took communion together. And you could really look at it scripturally. They probably did it almost every day. They took communion together. And Jesus said, do this often in remembrance of me. Because one of the problems we have, we forget. We forget things. We take things for granted. And we should never, ever take for granted what the Lord Jesus did for us upon the cross. Amen. So it says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we take this little wafer and we break it. And in the same way which Jesus did that night, he prayed. And we pray today, Father, thanking you for your body, thanking for the body of Christ that was broken on our behalf, that Lord, by every stripe, every blow upon your body, Scripture says we are healed. We thank you for what you endured on the cross for us, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We worship you. And we take this bread and we receive it into our body, remembering and giving thanks for what you did for us. In Jesus' name. the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes I don't know if you recognize it but I do believe that the Lord's return is drawing very near and so as we take this cup Lord recognizing what you did for us the blood that was poured out on our behalf. And through the blood of Jesus, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. We thank you for the substitutionary lamb that, Lord, you became that propitiation for our sins. You took our sins upon the cross. And your blood has allowed us to be justified before you. We thank you. By faith, we praise you and worship you and receive that forgiveness. And we remember as we partake of this cup, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
You're all together. 
Thank you for your goodness to our life, Lord God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the promises of your word, Lord God. Thank you for who you are. You are the creator of all things. The only uncreated thing. And you're for us. You're with us. You never leave us or forsake us. You're within us. And greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You sustain us. You abide in us. Or do you even work within us to overcome our deficiencies, weaknesses, shortcomings, Lord God? When we don't even know what to pray, you're groaning within us and interceding with words. It's too deep for words, it says. Thank you your faithfulness to our lives. Thank you. Father, we're not even fully aware (laughs) of how to even totally worship you with the right words to tell you everything we're so thankful for that you do for so many things that you do for us. We're not even aware. We thank you that you are faithful, always looking out for us in our behalf. We walk in your presence and in your favor. We thank you. We're your kids and you love us in that way that we can come before you and say, Abba, Father, my Father, we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why don't you be seated? Good morning, Freedom Center Church. I hope everyone is well and is feeling great. I am William, also known as Will, or the Allstate Guy. I would like to invite all unmarried young adults ages 18 to 28 to the fresh and exciting ministry, drum roll please, (laughs) called to greatness, also known as CTG, where we will have fellowship among our peers, lively get-togethers, and hear biblical-based messages. In fact, bring your Bibles Tuesday, where we'll enjoy light refreshments and receive a word from God. Tuesday, April 16th, here at the Freedom Center Church from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Just know, if you want to be in good hands, come and join us. Amen. See you soon. Peace and blessings. (laughs) All right. Yeah, so that's a new group that has launched, and um, we recognize just brainstorming probably 29 to 30 um, kind of uh, college-aged young people that in our congregation, and they had their first event, had 40 young people there. It's awesome. So just going to get gooder and gooder, as they say, and uh, excited about what the Lord's doing there. All right. Turning your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, and um, if I can get mine to open, there we go. We're going to begin there at uh, verse 21. And I called today a passage, uh, Preparing the Heart to Pray. And um, we looked last week just revisiting we had Easter the, the week before, so we had paused in our study in First John. But 
So we revisited last Sunday, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, that God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. And uh, two arenas that we need confidence and boldness for. First of all, that we, uh, regardless of the verdicts of men or even the condemnation that we may bring on ourselves, understanding that God is greater than even our own hearts. And we need confidence and we need assurance as the children of God, as we're invited into his presence, because there is a day coming. Amen. We will stand before him. And I want to stand before him in that day and not to shrink back, but have confidence and trust in his mercy and in his forgiveness, his grace. But we also need confidence and boldness today to walk into his presence, to come boldly before his throne of grace, as scripture says, come boldly before the throne of grace that we might find help in our time of need. We need help with things to walk out his purpose and his will for our life in the earth. And uh, we have to trust God's forgiveness in that process. Trust God's word. First of all, he cannot lie. That when he says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, I believe him. I trust him in that. And when my own heart might judge me, even with some things that sometimes we just mess up, right? Sometimes things are right in my thinking. But still, I have confidence that God is greater than my own heart. We want confidence before God in that day of judgment, but we also want confidence before the Lord right now. Amen? Confidence and boldness are directly correlated with asking. Answered prayer. People don't usually ask when they're not confident. People don't usually ask when they feel insecure. And Jesus said, John 14, 14, he said, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Huh, all right. Now, we clarified last week, that's not selfish things. He's not the genie in the bottle. This is about praying the will of the Father. That becomes clear in 1 John. is a verse that we'll look at coming up where he clarifies that. that we, as we ask anything according to his will, he hears and he does it. And that's the context of this prayer life, the context of this confidence, the, com the, the context of this boldness is that we're his kids. Over and over in this letter, it's, you know, I write unto you little children, and uh, that we have confidence before God because we are his children. That's why we can come before him and cry out, Abba, Father. We are his kids. We belong to him. But just as we, many of us, have raised kids, we know that our kids did not get everything they requested. Hello? We'll talk about that a little bit more here. But as they matured, they began to ask for things oftentimes that they actually needed. Well, guess what? Those requests were real and relevant to their life, and I did not want to withhold those things to my children. I want to bless my kids. Matthew 7, 11, uh, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So if we operate in that way and think that way, how much more our Heavenly Father who is perfect and holy thinks that way towards his children. So here we are, 1 John 3, verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. In whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in us, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So these four verses have led us to a place of understanding a little bit of how prayer works, how prayer gets answered. This letter, once again, written in the context of father and child relationship, I write unto you little children. There's this constant reminder, we're his children. We walk and live within this relationship whereby we approach him as Abba Father. And in keeping with that thought, we can relate our own experience of parenting with some degree of accuracy, not completely, as it said in scripture, that we being evil, but still with that, with that deficiency that I have, I still have some understanding in parenting to be able to relate that with some accuracy to this idea of answered prayer. 
And uh, we, we could relate our feelings of how it was as a parent and how we reacted towards our kids, how we approached our kids' request because we wanted to bless them. I can tell you when my kids were grateful, when my kids were humble, when my kids were obedient, they usually had my ear. Hello? If they had been acting entitled, getting into trouble, if they still had the nerve to come ask me for something, they probably were not going to get a yes. Hello? And if it was something uh, under better circumstances, I might have given it to them. But because of the condition of where their heart was at, I was not. Because of a bad attitude or where their heart was at the moment, they're not getting those things. And I, I've said this before, but my son, Gregory, was a master at this process of turning a no into a yes. We'd go into a store we're checking out. I could see him looking at the candy bar. And he'd turn around. He'd kind of hold it and say, Daddy, can I, can I have this? My default answer was always, no. Put it back. He puts it back. And then I would watch him. And I will tell you, his general reaction was, yes, sir. He puts it back, goes over by the cart, or he'll come over by me while I'm at the register and hold my hand. Right? Never asked again. Doesn't whine, because if he'd have whined, that no is not going to be turned into a yes. But I'd watch him. I'd watch him, and in that process, right before we finalized that transaction, if his attitude was right to that process, go ahead and get it. We put it in there, right? He was great at this. Daddy, can I have that candy bar? No, son. Put it back. Yes, sir. Didn't complain. Didn't ask a second time. Took my answer. There were times, I'm going to tell you, didn't always get it for whatever reason. Might not buy it. Many times, though, and you can knock it if you want to, many times I did. I did because of humility. I did because of gratitude. I did because of the condition of his heart. I looked for that before I just bought him a candy bar. But I wanted to bless my son. And I can tell you, gratefulness. I can think of all of my, my, all of my children. I don't think there's a time. I can't ever recall a time because I would listen for it every time. We'd be on the road, on vacation, on a trip. You pull into Waterburger, whatever it might be, Taco Bell, whatever we pull in. Go and pull into a fast food place. Order what they want, right? Get on the road. And just as soon as we get on the road, one of them, thank you, Daddy. Oh, yes, thank you, Daddy. You'd hear all of them chime in thanking me for that food. Gratitude, gratefulness. I mean, my ears were perked for it. I wanted to hear that from my kids. I will tell you, this is a story of Pete Sanchez, who wrote, I exalt thee. Um, I was at a worship conference. He was speaking, and uh, he wanted to bless his kids and went out and bought a, a, um, a, a play, play set for his kids. And uh, Put it all, spend all this time, you know, have you ever done that where you go get the little, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, a little playground thing and it takes you forever in a day to put it together. All, you got all the nuts and bolts and you always wind up with stuff left over, not sure what that was for, but hey, it looks good, let's put it out there. Goes through all the trouble setting up this little playground set for them and they all run out there and they're playing all over it and not one time did they ever say thank you, daddy. And he watched him for a little bit, and there was no gratitude. You know what he wound up doing? He disassembled it, put it back in the box, took it back to Walmart. You might think that's hardcore, but he was teaching his children a valuable lesson to be grateful, to have gratitude. I can tell you, we live in a culture that lacks that. A lot of entitlement, gratitude, humility, being thankful. These are things that we're to exhibit in our life as believers. It says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because, that's a real important word there, because, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So, 
If we're confident in his love for us, if we're confident in his forgiveness and his assurance for us, that he loves us, he'll never forsake us and leave us, his heart's towards us, he's for us, not against us, we have confidence in him, our heart is assured, we come before God with our requests, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, and then this most important word, because, we receive because. Because of what? Because we keep his commandments. And because we do the things that are pleasing to God. We do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So just as a very serious point, folks, effective praying, having your prayers answered, has so much more to do with your heart than it does your confession. Hello. Having your prayers answered has more to do with your heart than it does your confession. My children were never required by me to get their confession right. They were required to get their heart right. People are trying to get their confession right and ignoring the condition of their heart. Folks are decreeing and declaring things like God is supposed to be Johnny on the spot and perform Because after all, I believe and I've confessed these things. There's power in my words. I want you to understand. Yes, there are some power that's within your words, but it's the ability to bless or curse. Hello? That's what's within your mouth. The ability to bless or curse. But the outcome of blessing and cursing has everything to do with the condition of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you get your word, your heart right, then guess what? You'll get your confession right. It's not the other way around. Right heart, right words. If we think that answered prayers aren't connected with right living, we deceive ourselves. Jesus modeled this for us. John 8, 29. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. This is Jesus speaking. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. For Jesus, doing the will of the Father was not an occasional choice in times of trouble. Hello? Can you think of all the deals that have been cut with God in times of trouble? Jesus didn't just do the will of God occasionally to try to get in favor with God and then do whatever he wanted the rest of the time. This was the way he lived all the time. There was never a moment when Jesus stepped out of harmony with the Father concerning the Father's will. The Father's constant presence in Jesus' life confirmed that there was never a moment when he did not do the Father's will. Never. Jesus walked in complete confidence that his prayers were heard. Lazarus was laid up in the tomb for days. His flesh was now stinking Jesus says, remove the stone. Martha rebuttals that request, says, oh, he's been in there for days. The odor will be awful. And Jesus says, did I not tell you to believe that you would see the glory of God? In John eleven thirty eight. 38, so they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. You always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. See, Jesus had full assurance, full confidence that the Father always hears his prayers. But even for Jesus, it was the prayers in keeping with the will of the Father that Jesus prayed. In the garden on the eve of his arrest, Jesus also prayed a prayer, and his prayer was heard even then. But the prayer was, if possible, let this cup pass from me, but even so, your will be done, not mine. Well, sometimes the cup doesn't pass. And in this instance, the cup was not going to pass from him. He had to stay within his Father's will. Effective prayers or connected to the Father's will, the will of the Father is what we need to ask for. So, effective prayers, it's also connected to how we live. 
1 Peter 3, 7. Men, brace yourself. Husbands, I'll say, put it that way. Husbands, brace yourself. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Hello? Now, this isn't a belittling statement here when it says uh, someone weaker since she is a woman. I think, if anything, our culture, if they could put their brain back in their skull, we would understand with men who think they're a woman competing in women's sports, which is destroying com competition in women's sports because there's a physical difference. Hello? And that's what this verse is saying. There's a physical difference, but even still, show her honor as a fellow heir. What is it saying there? Husbands, don't act like a big bully. Hello? When men, we as men, fail to honor and cherish our wives, put that word cherish, I would, I would tell you, our, our last little marriage conference that we did was probably the best material that we have done and it was on cherish because when you understand that it made so much sense common sense i had more men that that registered with than any conference that we've done that material just made sense and that idea of cherish showcasing honoring putting on a pedestal and the the picture the analogy that we use is that male ballet dancer he he showcases that ballerina and we're to do that as husbands, um, we, we're to be sensitive, not insensitive, not to ignore her feelings, not to ignore her strengths, not to ignore her weaknesses. We play, if we do, we place ourselves in a spiritual hole. Our prayers are hindered. See, our actions, the way we live, does impact our prayer life. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. And here's your main reason, men, for doing so. This is the main reason for honoring and cherishing her. She deserves it. Hello? She deserves it. She deserves it. Sunday for my 60th, uh, I guess that was in the second service, and it, it's funny because I'm, 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 I like... To, I'm real sensitive to the flow of worship, and, and uh, Roy was going to be doing uh, the uh, uh, worship response in the second service for the first time. We pushed him, make him step out, and, and uh, you, you want to do that coming out of a little bit of a flow of worship. Well, we've done this celebrative music, and Andrew's going into the worship response, and I'm like, well, no, 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 no. Let's do the next song. And he goes, well, it's, it's too slow. So well, I want it slow. It's a worship response. And he goes, trust me, we've got something planned. And so I had to step back. Okay, let me ride this thing out. I knew at that point I'm in trouble. They're going to do something, right? And when we got to that point, three of the ushers came forward with a basket and a dozen roses. Three of our ushers were holding single roses and handed me roses. And I looked at everybody. I was like, I've never been given roses before. Of course, it was to be funny, right? And Thomas, one of the ushers, said, uh, well, think of it as the Rose of Sharon. I said, well, I live near Rose Sharon. How about that, right? We laughed, right? But when I got those flowers, it hit me all of a sudden. You know, those flowers aren't for me. Those flowers are for my wife. Because I just turned 60. December will be 40 years of marriage, two-thirds of my life. This woman has put up with 40 years out of that 60 years of life. Hello? She earned those flowers. Hello? She deserved it, man. <laughs> Frank knows what I'm talking about here. She's to be honored because she deserves it. Guys, that alone, honoring and cherishing your bride, will make for great prayer life. Also helps in other ways, but we're going to keep this PG. Hello? But your prayers are heard. Here's another behavioral action that has direct impact to prayers being heard. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Matthew 6, verse 14. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Hmm. 
See, asking God forgiveness, this is entry-level prayer. This is the first prayer you actually pray to God that is heard and responded to. It's the genesis of your relationship with God where the Lord Jesus Christ, you confess that I'm a sinner before him. I'm a sinner, Lord God. I believe what you did for me upon the cross. I trust what you did for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and come in and be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit. This is Christianity 101. Forgiveness. It all begins right there. Forgiveness. 1 John 1 9. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. See, that's prayer. <laughs> You're asking God to forgive you. But if you truly desire for that prayer to be heard and answered, then your heart must also be willing to forgive others. The forgiveness you fail to give is the forgiveness you will fail to receive. I did say that effective prayers, prayers that are heard and answered, have everything to do with our heart, condition of our heart. Let's get back to our text one more time. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Our heart is assured. We have confidence before God. We receive from God meaning our prayers are heard. We receive from God because we keep his commandments. We do the things that are pleasing to him. Now John defines commandments for us. Believe in Jesus, God's son, and love one another. This is how he's defined his commandments. Believe in the Lord Jesus, his son, and love one another. Sounds familiar to me. Kind of sounds like maybe the Shema. Hello? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. How about Jesus summing up the law? Matthew 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He's quoting Deuteronomy. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So you can take the Ten Commandments. Look at the Ten Commandments. The first four deal with loving God, and then five through ten deal with the responsibilities we have in loving and living with one another. This is the commandment. Love God, love others. Oh, by the way, it's right there as well. <laughs> loving God, loving others, living intentionally. Do the things that make this reality. If you do the things that make that a reality, loving God and loving one another, then you are actually generating the things, the actions, the way of life that will please God. Everything that pleases God falls under those two areas, loving God and loving one another. Faith in Jesus and loving one another are interlinked. They go together. You can truly experience, you, you can truly experience either one, but you can't experience one without the other. Then we see that the one that keeps these commandments, God abides in us. Now this isn't a mystical thing. This isn't some mystical experience. This is a reality. Through your confession in Jesus Christ, believing upon him, and then through submitting to his truth, attempting to live your life in a way that's pleasing to God, loving God and loving one another and being intentional in that process. By this we know we belong to him and that God truly abides within us. This becomes evidence that we are abiding in him. You know, the saying is, the proof is in the eating of the pudding. The proof's not in the pudding. The pudding's just the pudding. The proof is when you eat it, right? When you eat it, say, like, mm, that's good. There's the proof. The proof is in the eating of the pudding. You couldn't even confess Jesus as Lord apart from his Holy Spirit within you. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. 
We're about to see in two more verses as we move into 1 John chapter 4 that everyone who truly confesses Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, as truly being the Son of God, this is confirmation of the Spirit of God within you. Holy Spirit is a testing, confirming within us. Holy Spirit is our witness that we are truly His, that we belong to Him. Abiding in Christ means you're filled with His Spirit. He's guiding you. He's directing you. He's leading you. He's teaching you. He's warning you. He's correcting you. Psalms 10, 17. Oh, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart, and you will incline your ear. See, the summation of all these instructions for us today is really this. Stay humble. Hello? It's a constant theme throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New. Humility. Did God resist the proud gives grace to the humble? So the real preparation of our heart for prayer can't be one occasion. <laughs> it's got to be a lifestyle. A lifestyle of humility before the Lord and before one another. Not thinking more of ourselves than we ought to. The evidence of a heart that is ripe for effective prayers is one set on loving God and loving one another. And I added this in here. I usually, when I have things that I don't know if I want to talk about, I put them in shades of gray here. <laughs> but Monday, we, Barry Curtis and I went to Second Baptist Church, and um, there was a a meeting there of pastors, about 100 pastors. And most of the event was put on by some men from North Carolina. God's really been moving in North Carolina. The lieutenant governor is a believer. Thank God our lieutenant governor is a believer. Dan Patrick was there. He was the keynote speaker of this event Monday. And um, he's the real deal. And uh, what's been happening in North Carolina is this has been a real call to... Uh, encourage Christians to run for public, public office. I mean, the best way to get rid of the mess that's in the offices is to replace them with better candidates, right? Believers, candidates with biblical views, calling pastors if they feel so led to run for public office, but also um, encouraging those within the body of Christ in your churches to run for public office. It's, it's one thing to you scream at your TV but that's not going to change anything. Hello? But get involved. The other was the encouragement to pastors is to not avoid talking about politics from the pulpit. <laughs> Saying that, and I've said this to you, it's, it's the main reason we're in the mess that we're in because the church went silent a long time ago. But one of the pastors from North Carolina and I think he was speaking of the lieutenant governor. I can't remember exactly the persons he was speaking of at the moment, but was sharing how he prayed for Joe Biden. And the room kind of got quiet. And that's one thing to pray for Joe Biden, but then he shared what he prayed about for Joe Biden. And when he shared, it got even more quiet. Because he shared, he said, I pray for Joe Biden. I pray that in eternity I'll be able to sit next to Joe Biden and talk to him about the things of God and worship God together. I pray that. What is he saying? I'm praying for his salvation. The room got real quiet. Because I have to say, that's not been my prayers for Joe Biden. I've, I've probably, probably prayed more of psalms over him. Fighting prayers but not salvation prayers. And then Wednesday night, this was a double hitter, because we have that on Monday. Then Wednesday night, we get into to, um, Romans 9. And you've got Romans 1 through 8, and Romans 8 comes to this, this crescendo. Romans 8 is just this most incredible chapter with all of these quotable verses and all these beautiful themes, even getting down to the point, what can separate us from the love of God? It goes through this extensive list of things from life to death, from heaven to hell, and all of these things, even no created thing, nothing can separate us from the love of God, as if we think this salvation thing had something to do with us in the first place, right? 
And he's been going through chapters 1 through 8, addressing the law, trying to convince that we're not saved by the law. We're saved through faith in Christ alone. The law has never been capable of saving. There's nothing redemptive in it. And so when he gets to chapter 9 and 10 and 11, all of a sudden it seems like he changed, but he didn't. Now what he's trying to do, he's speaking to the Jews in Rome. He's trying to now identify what a, a, a Jew really is. What makes a Jew a Jew? Is it just because they're circumcised? Well, what makes a Christian a Christian? Are you a Christian just because you come to church? Or gone to church all your life? No, he talks about circumcision of the heart. Of our heart. The condition of our heart. This is what it's all about. And then he makes this statement. He says, I would trade places. I would prefer that I be accursed and separated from Christ and that my kinsmen be saved. Think of that. He says, I would prefer taking that wrath of God and be eternally separated from God if it meant that my kinsmen, my people, my flesh would be saved. Boy, I looked at that and I thought, oh my gosh, how far the church has come from that. We don't even weep over the lost. We get mad at them, right? The condition of our heart. And I'll just say that to you. But you'll take that and diligently meditate on that before the Lord, that the Lord would change our hearts. Because honestly, when I looked at that, it kind of shook me up when I read that about Paul. And then, then I realized, you know, actually, that is the most Christ-like attitude because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He was willing to be separated from the Godhead. He was willing to take on the wrath of God on our behalf. He was willing to be accursed for us. And we have to have that same heart. Charles Spurgeon said of that verse, he said that a church that's just maintaining is not a church at all. And we've really got into a condition where we just maintain. We tried to build our big churches and have our programs. But the real objective is that we see people saved. That we see people snatched out of that damning situation that they're in. Just like we were. Hello? Every one of us. Even Joe Biden, and I can name some other names, I won't do it, that make me mad when I watch the news, but that maybe we would see the world a little differently and pray for the salvation of people. Let that be our goal in everything that we do, that we would want to see people saved. Amen. Everybody stand. Lord, just recognizing the effectiveness of prayers, Lord, that effective prayers rolls out of, it's produced, it's a product of hearts that are prepared, hearts that have been conditioned that in a way that we love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love each other. And we have a Christ attitude towards others. We walk in humility, gratefulness, gratitude. Not thinking more of ourselves than we ought to. Lord, that we have a, a brokenness for a lost world. Just as Paul was, he said, I, I grieve inside. Lord, that we would have that same heart. I just want to read it to you. I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed 
separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And Lord Jesus, that that would be our hearts because that is your will. That's what you're connected to in the earth. This is a, a window of redemption that we are in. And Lord, we are in that final window, that the final days of that redemptive plan. And there's a day coming when that trumpet shall stand and all men will stand before you. And this moment will be over. And people will stand before you and be accounted for what they did or did not do concerning the Lord Jesus. And I pray, Father, you would alter our hearts in every way, Lord, because our prayer life, effective prayer life, prayer life that's connected to the will of the Father, prayer life that's connected to kingdom things, it's all connected with our heart. Change our hearts that we might pray the things of your heart. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come as we close. Be available to pray. If you need prayer for whatever, healing, need some, just some agreement with whatever you might be walking through in your life. Oh, thank you. Before I forget, men's meeting tomorrow night. I don't think that was said today. Men's meeting tomorrow night, 6 p.m. But Father, we thank you and we praise you for what you have done in our lives and we worship you. So let's just worship as we close. Altars open and we'll close in worship.
Whatever level, Lord, that it will resonate within hearts in some area, or that we'll really recognize the really the effectiveness of our prayer really is has so much to do with the condition of our heart. And that our heart would be in a good place. And let it begin with just repentance. Let it begin, begin with confession. And Lord, that is the prayer you are, your ears are so alert to. And through that process of repentance and confession before you, that you hear and you are faithful and just to forgive. And then out of that outflow, that Lord, we would just begin to lay our heart before you. Because we live in a troubled world, but you've encouraged us, let not your heart be troubled. Well, this is the process of relieving a troubled heart. That we're actually able to come with confidence and boldness before your throne and lay all of our concerns and petitions there. And walk away from that process with confidence and boldness that you heard. Now we've been imparted with grace to walk through what we need to walk through. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome week.